the UNDP res rep uh, and UNFPA rep uh, before that. Uh, so Andrew Cox, Chief of Staff and Strategy Agra, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be here today to see the launch of the AASR. Um, really such an important uh, uh, moment for this, this, uh, the launch of this report. It's, it's highly pertinent, I think, to uh, where we are right now in the, in the time around COVID-19, but also in terms of the uh, opportunity that comes um, you know, to, for, for African agriculture and in fact for sustainable development across the continent. Just a little bit of history, if I may. Uh, AGRA has been running the AASR since 2013. Uh, we've touched on quite a number of disparate thematic areas, including climate change, uh, youth in agriculture, the private sector. And now it seems quite appropriate, given that um, Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent, that we turn to the important question of feeding Africa's cities and the, and the opportunities which can come from that. So in many of our previous reports, we've been focusing on the supply side uh, affecting farmers and food systems capacity. This really allows us to turn then to much more to the, to the demand side. And to do that around the question of urban uh, food markets and uh, the linkages between urban and rural spaces, we reached out to a broad range of disciplinary actors and uh, specialities. Um, this year we've been looking very closely at people with expertise in uh, food safety, public health, uh, municipal governance, uh, town planning and international food marketing. And as a result, we've had a, uh, a real mix of African and international uh, specialists. Um, four of the chapters of the eight were led by African scientists and leaders, uh, four by international uh, specialists. So as we go into this uh, launch event, uh, um, perhaps some of the things to bear in mind are that we see uh, you know, the shift of Africa uh, from being a rural population to being an urban population, having a fundamental impact on Africa's 60 million farms. We're seeing a, a center of gravity therefore that moves, but also unparalleled uh, opportunities arising from this. Um, we see uh, mayors and district governments and urban planners suddenly becoming important players um, in the food and agriculture space. And we realize that if we're going to have effective urban food systems, we need to think very differently about how we coordinate so many diverse uh, players and actors. Uh, it scarcely needs to be said, but I think as we look at the situation right now, COVID-19 really points to some of the challenges and maybe even some of the fragility of urban uh, food systems. And of course, the, you know, perhaps the most vulnerable at, 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 at rural level. So as we go now uh, through our speakers, uh, the, the, the report really has uh, made a, a strong effort to address many of the issues related to that. And we're going to be hearing um, more about that now from our, our uh, specialized speakers in the panel. Thank you very much. Great, great, thank you very much. Andrew. Okay, now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome uh, for remarks uh, the president of AGRA, Dr. Agnes Kalibata. Let me say one or two words about uh, Dr. Kalibata. Uh, she is the president of the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, where she leads the organization's efforts with partners to ensure a food secure and prosperous Africa through rapid sustainable agricultural growth that focuses on building systems required for farmers to access technologies that improve productivity. Prior to joining AGRA, Dr. Kalibata was Rwanda's Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources up until 2014. Uh, she also has many other uh, leadership positions and has a distinguished track record. She's an, a, a scientist uh, in her own right uh, she won the Yara Prize uh, eight years ago. That's now called the Africa Food Prize. So it's my distinct honor to have uh, Dr. Kalibata here with us today. Our keynote address is coming from uh, Dr. Rudy Rabinge. And um, Rudy, let me say a few words about him to uh, introduce him. Uh, Rudy is the Emeritus University Professor, Sustainable Development and Food Security 
at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. He fulfilled many functions in academia, such as the chairperson of the Academy Foundations, the Dean of Research, architect of WUR, chair of the CGAIR system. He was the president of large cooperatives and agribusiness and private sector companies. He was a member of the Senate at regional and national level. He was also the chair of the UN Task Force on the Green Revolution in Africa and presented in 2004 the report, Realizing the Promise and the Potential of African Agriculture. So Rudy, it's a distinct uh, pleasure and honor to have you here giving the keynote. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. It's an uh, honor and a privilege to uh, be with you and to give this uh, short uh, speech. And uh, as you rightly indicated, food security, uh, that's the availability and production of sufficient food and access of, uh, to the food, uh, which is sound and safe, is crucial everywhere for sustainable development. And globally, uh, the last decades, we have been successful in uh, increasing food production substantially, such that the availability worldwide is better than ever before. Nevertheless, there's a lot of hunger. And uh, at places, and especially regionally, you see a lot, lot of differences, and more specifically in Africa. And everywhere, the urbanization is taking over. Uh, now more than 50% of the people are already living in, uh, in cities or in, even in big cities. That's a, a major problem to feed them and to uh, have them access to sufficient and uh, good quality food. And this, therefore, I think so very important that you address this issue more specifically in this African Agriculture Status Report of this year. And Africa's cities currently provide the largest and probably most rapidly growing agriculture markets in Africa and probably also globally. If you look at the situation worldwide and you see that Africa is staying behind and that has uh, improved considerably and for that reason the development of markets are crucial. And the urban food sales in Africa amount to roughly between you uh, 200 and 250 billion per year. And some 80% is coming from domestic uh, African suppliers. That's different from what many people expect, but that's the situation. It should be probably even better, but it is already 80%. And looking forward, Africa's rapidly growing cities and the food markets offer the largest and fastest growing market opportunity available to the continent's 60 million farms at this moment. And that has been mentioned already also by Andrew. And the pressures from the current COVID-19 pandemic exacerbate uh, the existing economic and social inequalities, aggravate problems of urban and undernutrition, and accelerate the urgency of urban food system planning and governance reforms. Therefore, it is very important that this year's Africa Agriculture Status Report is focusing on the feeding of the African cities. And uh, uh, this report arrives at an important time. Uh, as you, as Andrew already indicated, city mayors, national governments, international institutions worldwide are all struggling to build back from COVID-19 in ways that ensure the long-term efficiency and safety of urban food supplies, as well as adequate protection for vulnerable protections, populations. It's for that reason that I applaud uh, AGRA and their many stakeholders and partners for viewing the challenge of feeding Africa cities as an opportunity to refocus efforts on the urban food systems in ways that will expand opportunities for African farmers while at the same time ensuring the safety and security of food access by vulnerable uh, urban populations. And to be more specific, there have been uh, priorities for moving forward which were formulated in the report and the analysis assembled in this report identifies five key public goods required to ensure the competitiveness of African suppliers, as well as food safety and security for urban consumers. First, improved urban food system governance. Second, efficient urban wholesale markets. Third, food safety regulation and enforcement. Four, regional free trade and agri agricultural policy harmonization. And fifth, agricultural research focused on high growth, high value food commodities. 
And based on my many years of experience working on these issues in national and international institutions, I wish to specifically highlight the following core areas that I see as requiring urgent, broad attention from AGRA and many others. First of all, use the promise and potentials of African agriculture. That means no complete free market or complete protection, but strengthen competitive ability of the farmers and their communities in order to uh, increase food production and the accessibility of food by the people living in cities. Second, optimize land use, and that's uh, the responsibility of governance, governments in order to have the better uh, well-endowed soils contributing substantially to the increase of food. There are ample opportunities to do so and use the less endowed lands for other purposes. And if you use the well endowed lands, that is sufficient to feed Africa's population. Power on uh, and create more power of the farmers and the communities on the markets, for example, by cooperatives. And third, innovation. Increase the way of producing in a better way, make ample use of external inputs, but in an efficient and effective way. And finally, third, highlight strengthen AGRAS as the intermediate organization. It's a reliable broker and an actor, a leader and pushing power for evergreen revolution. And this evergreen revolution, so it's not more, more food alone, more and safeguarding uh, biodiversity and looking at the situation uh, of the environment and fulfilling the requirements and the needs of the cities. In, and that is why I think that's the role Agra has to play, play to feed Africa cities in the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rabinge. That's uh, those uh, remarks of yours, I think, help us frame uh, many of the key priorities for the panelists uh, for the remainder of this session. Okay, then, uh, let's move on then to the uh, one of the architects of this year's uh, African Agricultural Status Report. Uh, and, and this is uh, will be given by none other than my former colleague uh, at Michigan State University, uh, Dr. Steve Hagblade. Steve. Uh, take us away. Okay, thanks, Tom. I admire your surf uh, surfboard collection in the background. I uh, mine are in the garage. I, I'm just going to give you a quick overview, uh, sort of a thirty-five thousand foot level uh, at the, the different analyses that took place this year uh, for the ASSR. Focus was on feeding African cities. I'm going to talk about the, the content really falls into two big categories. The first three topics that I'm going to talk about here are the urban setting and the impact that has on agriculture, the demand side and the supply side. Uh, and then the last two sections of my remarks are going to focus on the policy implications. So uh, just to, uh, just to set the stage, I think you've all seen this, uh, urban population growth in Africa is the fastest in the world, has been for the past several decades, projected to continue to be the fastest in the world over the coming several decades. So very, very rapid growth. Uh, if you use official data, 2035 is the year at which the continent becomes majority urban. But what I want to point out is that it may be happening a lot sooner than that. And, and it, I want you to look here at the right at this picture. This is a map of Maputo, uh, Mozambique. And I want you to look at these brown areas. These are the built up areas of Maputo. And, what you, uh, and then you see the administrative boundaries there in crosshatch. And what's obvious here is that the town has spilled outside of its uh, designated uh, administrative boundaries. And you see growing up north uh, along the roadways, uh, this is a common feature in most Africa. 
when you look spatially, you define urban areas as the built up areas around these urban cores, then you include those peri-urban spillovers. Well, by that definition, Africa is already majority urban, has been since 2015. So the future is already here, 20 years before the uh, official data projected. Uh, and, and these cities are really vitally important. They are uh, in the animated version of this PowerPoint, have these leading circles in just the the, uh, the heartbeat of the continent here. And you see uh, uh, resources flowing into the cities to fee feed them, but also uh, reverse flows of labor, transport, communication, and so on. So the, in terms of the economic uh, core of Africa, the, the cities are, are huge. They're the biggest, biggest, agricultural market on the continent by far. Uh, ballpark figure 250 billion per year. Uh, just as a point of comparison, if you take total agricultural exports from Africa, total annually is about a billion. So domestic urban food markets are at least five times as big as the export market and they're growing very, very fast. Here I'm showing you urban share of total food consumption by country, all of the big three economies, Egypt, South Africa, Nigeria, way over 50%, uh, 20 more to continent wide, the urban food markets dominate uh, and not in the future, they dominate now. Now to show you how this magnetic forces work, here's some, uh, some studies summarized out of West Africa looking at maize trades and the magnets, the urban centers are these brown circles and you see the big city, uh, Parano in the interior, uh, most of them along the coast. And they serve as magnets pulling in these blue areas are the surplus producing areas. And what you see is a network of supply feeding in to feed these cities. And uh, these pull forces are, are so large that they, they pull in uh, food supplies sometimes from quite long distances. Uh, we have a whole chapter in this uh, report looking at the composition. So we know these markets are big, but really specifically for farmers, where, where, where is, the, is the money to be had here? Uh, and uh, I want to highlight, of course, processed foods are, are when you have long supply chains and uh, you have to store foods and therefore you have to process and package them. Um, but I want to talk about this bottom segment, the perishables, because when we look at impact on agriculture, on the supply side of agriculture, this is what really, uh, really matters quite a lot. And, and so the first supply side uh, impact I would highlight is again a spatial impact. Looking at, you've got these high value perishables that are big and growing very fast. And so they're high value and they're perishable. And what that means is a lot of the incentive structure for farmers revolves around focusing on short supply chains that allow you to get these perishable commodities to market with minimum loss. So you have lots of examples. In any African city you walk through, you find poultry farming in the backyard, you find meat, meat fattening operations, certainly throughout West Africa before Tabasco. You find horticulture farms everywhere. There's a little water. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, a market. Um, the, these high value perishables, they're, they're big, they're growing fast. And for farmers, this is very good news because if you look at uh, returns to land, it's five to 10 times as high uh, as it is for uh, lower value staples. And so for farmers, these are growing markets, but they're highly lucrative markets. Now, the urban areas also exert influence spatially on the structure, not only the condition of what's produced, but also how it's grown. And I want to talk a little bit about intensification 
This is something you see col uh, commonly. You look at this uh, horizontal axis here, it shows you distance from Bamako, the capital of Mali. And I want you to look at wage rates. Now you shouldn't be surprised to see that in peri-urban areas and villages nearby the cities, wage rates are high. They're about double what they are in remote areas. Why is that? It's because near cities, people have other options. They can commute, they can do many different things and farmers have to pay more. So the wage rates are significantly higher uh, in the peri-urban zones. Input prices, well, exact opposite. You see that the, the supply depots, the import warehouses are in urban areas and inputs are distributed out from there. And that's why you see herbicide prices. In this case, you could look at fertilizer or anything else. Um, you have a, goes from nine, $9 a liter up to about 15. So you can do the math here. If you're, if you're a farmer trying to compete in these urban markets, and you have to control weeds. If you're nearby the cities, you've got, you're facing high wage rates and low input prices. So how are you gonna uh, control weeds? You're gonna use herbicides. These farmers in the nearby zones, near, nearby the big cities, over 75% of them use herbicides to control weeds. Out in the, the more remote areas, it's only 25%. So it's triple, the adoption rate is triple. And look at the application rates. The application rates are four times as high. So the point is that these, these magnetic forces, the cities generate spatial impacts that affect the spatial composition of farm production, but also the rates of intensification. Uh, land valuations, uh, of course, increase as you, uh, as you near urban areas. Um, and so what you see is a, a series of impacts from cities on agriculture. The composition changes towards these high value products. Uh, intensification takes place as you approach the cities. The, the demand for processed foods, you've got this explosion, the 2019, uh, uh, ASSR focused on this third bullet here about the, this incredible growth in agro-processing. Uh, it's quite huge. You see land consolidation. Our distinguished moderator has le led work on this. And you, you find this in, in, in a great many places that the responsive, these emerging commercial farmers that are actively targeting these uh, urban markets uh, are, are medium scale. Recent study from uh, Ethiopia uh, pointed out that there, there's a whole green belt of peri-urban horticulture farmers. They're all medium scale farmers. Uh, the value of that peri-urban horticulture is now greater than the entire value of the flower exports from Ethiopia. These are big markets uh, uh, and they're growing very fast. Now, what, what's gonna to happen to smallholder farmers? Uh, we're gonna talk about that down the road. There, there are some pressures put on smallholder farmers. They, they, they need some help here to, to navigate this transition. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, challenges that our different chapter authors have identified, uh, six major ones, and I'll just very briefly uh, sail through here. First one is food safety, and I, I'm happy that we have Professor Ngeti here uh, with us to talk about this. What you need to understand is that this high value perishables are growing very fast. They're also the commodities at greatest risk to consumer safety because they, especially the livestock products carry parasites, sister sarcosis, tapeworm, that kind of thing bacterial pathogens, di diarrheal diseases, uh, cholera that uh, often on horticultural products. And so what you're seeing in Africa today is what you see broadly worldwide as the food system changes. Here you've got a transitioning food system and this vertical axis tells you the food safety burden. Well, 
in terms of challenges, this is really important because this transition uh, is the most vulnerable point in the system. And, and so I hope we'll get some discussion on this very serious issue uh, and, and one that, uh, that uh, public health officials and, and ag managers of ag markets really need to get a handle on. It's a very, very important challenge. Second challenge, and this, I was surprised at uh, the number of different disciplines, the urban planners, the agricultural marketing people, uh, the export folks, everybody uh, is worried about urban wholesale markets. This is uh, a scene that you see in, in, unfortunately, this comes out of the uh, Soweto market in, in Lusaka. This infrastructure, the wholesale markets are the, the pivot in the whole food system. Millions of farmers supply millions of consumers and the funnel through which they reach those millions of consumers are these urban wholesale markets. And a lot of them are overstretched, over capacity, and this, this is a huge problem. Third problem is competitiveness. Look at this, I, we've got uh, $250 billion. Well, uh, 74 billion a year is coming in from, uh, from somewhere else. Um, we have a couple chapters in the ASSR looking at this competitiveness question. I would simply highlight that it's a complicated issue. Uh, wheat, for example, the single biggest commodity import into Africa. You can't grow hard varieties of winter wheat in Africa. You need uh, a, a freeze, a winter freeze. So some of these, Africa is simply going to have to import. Uh, but has comparative advantage in other, other things, things like vegetable oil, sugar, and rice. Uh, there are different reasons for this, but there, there seem to be some clear opportunities for, for import substitution. Um, and we find in a number of markets that urban food prices are growing faster than domestic supply. It, it's a signal that domestic suppliers aren't able to meet the full demand. In part because of uh, self-inflicted, I showed these long chains. We have a whole chapter in this ASSR focusing on these internal trade barriers uh, and it's a quite serious problem. If you're going from the Sahel to Accra, you find 50 different roads, checkpoints that look just like this. And the suppliers are competing with the Brazilians and the Argentinians to supply meat to these coastal markets. So how many of these checkpoints, do you think the Brazilians face 50 checkpoints as they ship goods across the ocean? No probably one at the port of arrival, but they've got a straight shot into these markets. And so really African suppliers are placed at a disadvantage when, well, when we have these artificial constraints that, that raise costs of internal delivery. It makes Africa as a continent more dependent than it needs to be on imported goods. Uh, fifth challenge that that comes out here is that these agricultural supply systems cover long distance and they cut across multiple jurisdictions. So you've got the mayor managing the city, you've got the district governor uh, managing the surrounding areas and you've got various provincial or state governments uh, managing uh, rural areas. Uh, and so if you have inconsistent policies or inconsistent infrastructure or protocols of any kind, uh, that poses problems, leads to a lot of discussion. We have a whole chapter talking about governance of urban food systems. And one of the key messages is that that governance needs to cut across administrative boundaries. And I'll just highlight one piece of this, Be because the, the center of gravity now has shifted to urban areas. Ag markets are predominantly urban now, and this urban wholesale market is the beating heart of the whole system. 
It's the point through which farmers reach uh, consumers. Who's in charge of this beating heart? Is it a heart surgeon? No, it's the mayor. Has the mayor been to medical school? No. He's got or she has the responsibility to manage these markets efficiently so that truckers don't spend half a day stuck in traffic so that the drainage is sloped properly so that you don't have stagnating water uh, and diseases and high losses. We've got new actors who don't know much about agriculture, who don't have many resources, who are suddenly managing vital, arguably the most vital part of the whole system. And that is a challenge. It's a challenge for them, but it's a challenge for farmers that, that would like to supply these markets safely and at low cost. To summarize, just wrap up here, Tom, uh, five main conclusions coming out of this, uh, really five areas where Agra and, and partners, uh, we believe need to focus their efforts to uh, allow small farmers and other local suppliers to benefit from these enormously growing uh, markets. Uh, First issue is governance. Look at chapter six uh, for, for these details. But basically, there's a lot of work on this. Uh, it's coming from many different angles. And I'd say the emerging uh, center of interest is on this top bullet on the right, what are called uh, territorial development initiatives. Some very interesting experimentation from from rural development folks, uh, urban planners, uh, uh, municipal government uh, finance people. Uh, you have to find ways to harmonize and coordinate policies across jurisdictions because these food channels move across jurisdictions. Uh, the urban wholesale markets, the single most important component of the whole system if you want to help farmers, this is the place you need to focus. If costs are too high here, if losses are too high here, farmers suffer and suppliers move elsewhere. The supermarkets will use these wholesale markets if they're working well. If not, they'll set up alternate supply sourcing systems that bypass these wholesale markets. And those typically exclude small farmers. So if you want small farmers to have access to urban markets, you need efficient, uh, efficient market structures and good management systems. So you look at chapter four in this report, there's an interesting discussion of, from China in the 1990s. This is one of the places where they focused their top priority was on urban wholesale food markets. It was a huge part of modernizing uh, their, their food system. Food safety, really important because of the growth of perishables, which tend to transmit a lot of these diseases. Uh, the folks responsible for this are under-resourced and overstretched. Uh, and well, we really need to get a handle on this. Uh, we have some panelists who can speak to this. It's a, it's a really important issue and, and African cities will need to get ahead of this curve uh, if these food systems are gonna be safe. Because if they're not, if local milk is not safe and we have studies from West Africa showing DDT uh, in, in, in milk supplies in, in urban areas. And if it's unsafe, then they'll import milk powder from abroad. So really, if you want African suppliers to compete here, if you want safe consumers, you really have to worry about the food safety. Um, this Africa country trade agreement really is focused on trying to, uh, to streamline internal flows. We know that a lot of these supply chains cut across borders. Last, Lastly, uh, the ag research system has a role to play here. Uh, instead of only or primarily focusing on staples, uh, work needs to broaden out here. Just, just an example, uh, in Ghana, uh, Dale airlifted up three euros each. 
Well, if you're airlifting day old chicks from Europe at three euros each, you're not very competitive. These, these are gen genotypes that are optimized for temperate conditions and feed stocks that are available in temperate areas. Uh, and so if, if African farmers are gonna be competitive, they need indigenous, uh, improved indigenous varieties that will allow them to compete cost effectively against the, the Brazilians who are flooding poultry uh, across the continent. So bottom line, five, five key takeaways here and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you all. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, that's a, a very thought provoking uh, presentation that you just made. Uh, I will not uh, attempt to summarize it in the interests of time. Uh, I think right now, uh, what we're going to do is go straight to the panelists. Uh, we have six distinguished panelists who can give remarks uh, that relate to the keynote, uh, as well as to the, so, uh, to the keynote of Dr. Rabinge, as well as to Steve's uh, description there. And then uh, I'd propose that we uh, allow our, the president of Agra to summarize and, and wrap up uh, toward, toward the end of, of those comments. Okay, so let us move straight to the first panelist, and that is you, Maximo Torero, uh, Chief Economist of the FAO. Maximo, please help us. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Steve, for a very nice presentation. I have uh, uh, six comments that I want to, to raise. Uh, I'm very short in the four minutes that we have. The, the first thing, the first, and those are related to the several challenges that you mentioned. And, and the first one is to understand that uh, food value chains are not in, only in the rural areas. They cross borders to urban and to peri-urban areas. Why? Because of infrastructure access, that means energy and so on. So when we look at a value chain, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, the production in the rural areas, but most of the packaging, the processing will happen in the peri-urban and, and, and urban areas. And that is very linked to the governance challenge that you mentioned because that means that the urban and the mayors have to design this. And that's something that we need to look carefully because it could have significant consequences if it is not managed properly. And that's what we are observing today, for example, with the COVID-19, that most of the problem is happening in the packaging, processing and, and transportation services because it's where there is more agglomeration in the way you, you package. So it's something very important to look at. And I think it's, it's a very important challenge that COVID-19 could open an opportunity to, to do something different. Second is that uh, there is also the issue of labor markets, which you mentioned uh, in the report, uh, which is really important because the labor demand is happening mostly in the urban and in the new urbanized areas. That's what is attracting the labor, not only in, in other non-farm activities, but also in the food processing and so on. And that's creating a problem relative to the rural areas. And that's where also we have the potential option of automatization. But the problem with automatization and that the velocity is moving right now because of COVID-19 is that you require some labor supply with certain skills and we are not there yet in those skills. So we need to be careful that these, these relative prices of labor, for, of labor between urban and peri-urban and rural uh, could create a consequence of significant inequalities because the rural areas won't be able uh, to have the, the labor demand uh, that, that, that is being supplied, meaning they will start to attract labor, labor supply from other sectors or from other countries because of the qualifications they need if we move towards uh, uh, automatization. So it's very important to look at that and to keep that in mind to avoid increasing inequalities. The third quest comment is on, on avoid exacerbation of inequality of smallholders. So the way you presented uh, and, and the issue is how we can make small farmers to comply with the standards and especially the food safety standards that we will need in the urban areas. What we will be observing is, is production of vegetables closer to uh, urban areas because that's feasible. You can do control environments where you can produce closer to urban areas and that is happening around the developing countries. But the other types of commodities we, will still be produced in rural areas. So how we avoid that these farmers are not excluded because the wholesale markets and the supermarkets won't be able to procure from them if they don't comply with the standards. And that's something that we need to, 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 to work so that we minimize that potential risk. As well, of, of course, we need to increase the food safety issue of the wholesale markets. You have seen what has, has happened in many Latin American uh, markets where they have to be closed. Uh, in Peru, for example, the wholesale markets had to be closed because they didn't have the, the health standards and the food safety standards that were required. 
Consumption patterns is a very important issue. Uh, and why? Because of the changing in patterns of, of eating uh, more processed food in the urban areas, which instead of moving towards healthy diets, the increase in demand is most towards processed food. And that is important because of the increase in overweight and obesity in these regions. So that's something that we need to look at, how we can improve information, how we can improve access to healthy diets. What we have seen in the latest SOFI that we produce is that 3 billion people cannot access to healthy diets, and, and a significant share of those are in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So how we can change this through information and also through bigger availability of, of more high-value commodities to have the diversity of diets you have is really important to minimize the NCDs. And finally, the trade issues. Uh, I think you refer about the importance of, of free trade and the importance of the African uh, free trade agreement. But one very important topic there is food safety, because a, a very important reason why this is not being implemented at full capacity is because of non-tariff barriers. And most of them are linking to food safety. So it's really important to assure that we develop something like the Food Safety, Pan-African Food Safety Agency to minimize those risks. And also to finalize, uh, don't forget that if we are looking at urbanization, we will be shifting from food losses to waste. And it's not only an issue of developed countries, also an issue of developing countries. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Maximo. Good points. I'd uh, like to now turn uh, to our next panelist, who is Dr. Ismahan Elwafi, who is the Director General of the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture, CBA. Uh, Ismahan, uh, four minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, to add to what um, Maximo has already addressed, um, in view of the move booming of both the population and the opportunities, I think really Africa should focus in the next two decades to two decades to, on innovation and technology to modernize the Africa agri-food sector as a whole. Africa needs really to improve its natural resource management. And that's because of climate change, because of soil degradation, but also the over exploitation we are seeing. It has to improve its existing food systems. And above all, it has to develop new food systems, focusing on the high value food commodities as it came very clearly in the report. So we, could, we are seeing a huge boom of import of food in the COVID-19 and before, right now, as it was mentioned again, the, the bill is quite high, it's about 35 billion. And in about five years only, it's gonna get to 110. So how could Africa really produce its own food? I think we need to go back to the basics, which really investing in research, and I'm very happy it came across as well. So Africa has to do its own research and development. I'm a geneticist. And they believe really when you do breeding, unless the crop has been exposed to the, to the local condition, it won't work as well as if it's brought as is from somewhere else. Uh, it needs to diversify its agri-food base uh, because diversification uh, across the sector, it's very important not only for nutrition reason, which we are all aware of right now, but also for environmental reason, ecosystem reason, and economic reason. One of the major things that we don't see in Africa enough, it's really good irrigation systems. Most of the farmers are at the mercy of the climate change and the weather. So I think Africa has to develop its irrigation system. Um, of course, large scale is very important, but the more you go to a remote area where you have the most remote people and the most marginalized people, the more you would need really small scale irrigation. And going back to what was said by Steve and Maximo, really looking at the whole value chain, because that's really cut across urban, rural, it touch everybody. It will allow not Africa only to, to maximize their input, because right now we see more, more export of raw material as a, as large, but if we move through towards the value chain, you get improvement along the value chain and you get better economic return to the farmers and to the others. You get employment plus, plus, plus. So I think really incentivizing the export of refined and processed food will make more of the business done in Africa and will employ the youth that is burgeoning in Africa. Thank you, Tom. Great, thank you, Ismahan. 
very interesting points. I think you're the first uh, person, uh, first speaker in this session who has actually referred to farm level issues. Uh, uh, and I, I was wondering uh, how that angle was going to come in. Uh, so thank you very much for highlighting that. Um, okay, our next panelist, uh, Monica Musonda. Uh, she is the CEO and founder of Java Foods, a uh, Zambian based company, uh, that uh, processing company. Monica, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the AASR. I think um, the points are very well acknowledged. And uh, being a processor on the ground, we definitely see what they're talking about. Um, the um, urbanization, changing consumption patterns, and we ourselves trying to understand what is motivating people to, to buy food. Um, is it really price? Is it um, aspiration? Um, it, what is the impact as well of COVID? So I, I really welcome the report. I would like to speak a little bit about nutrition. Uh, Java Foods focuses on uh, processing uh, 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 nutritious foods using locally um, uh, uh, con um, resourced um, raw materials. And we find it's not just talking about really uh, enhancing food systems, but also having discussions on nutrition. I have heard uh, two previous speakers speak about nutrition, and I would really encourage, I think, a little bit more conversation around it. Um, as a producer of nutritious products, what we find is that the, um, in the urban areas, you're really competing against a lot of, um, uh, if I can use the word, junk food. Uh, it is uh, most of your your consumers are younger are are, are looking for uh, price sensitive uh, products and are also uh, their 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 motivation to buy food or their education is actually for many of our private sector companies. So what people are saying on their social media, what they are calling nutrition, etc. So somehow it's it is creating um, a really difficult uh, playing field for us nutritious food makers. And I thought I could add my two cents by talking about what we could do to encourage more private sector uh, uh, companies to actually produce nutritious foods, how we could also help uh, you know, create or add value to the food systems, but make sure that the urban cities are actually eating the right food, nutri nutrient dense foods. So I have a few points. Um, I, and which I would like to share. The first one is I would really like to see from the government side a, a lot more engagement with private sector businesses such as myself to create the right enabling environment to allow more producers to look into producing nutritious foods. I say this, for instance, we've, we've seen in many countries um, um, discussions around sugar tax, uh, discussions around in, um, uh, put a uh, zero rating of certain inputs for nutritious foods. So if you're putting micronutrients in your in your product, should they be should they be taxed because the end product is actually going to be a nutritious product. So it's really, really engaging uh, private sector and understanding what we could actually make, which has a, a benefit for the consumer and perhaps doing things like zero rating it. So the consumer gets a benefit of a product which is nutritious. I think the argument often is the case that nutritious products are really expensive, but it's really understanding what it has taken to, to deliver this product and understanding the costs. I mean, COVID has depreciated many country, uh, currencies on the continent and really pushed up costs, which has an impact on the cost of food. The second one I would like to talk about is this aspect of misrepresentation. Sometimes uh, a lot of my private sector companies are guilty of this, uh, labeling uh, foods as nutritious and sometimes causing confu confusion in the market. It would help to see a little bit more regulation, a little bit of fair play around, you know, making sure that there's a right representation of what the food is, what is in it, um, trying to educate the consumer, even simple things like what's on the food label, and but ensuring that we implement those sorts of uh, regulations correctly for the benefit of the consumer. Um, also, not talking about not really reinventing the wheel. Um, we, I'm part of um, an association called the Scaling Up Bus uh, Nutrition Business Network, which is an association of bu uh, business who focus on nutrition. And I think a discussion with companies that continuously push nutrition agenda is also helpful. Understanding what we are doing um, and how we can how we can support them. For instance, here in Zambia, we're about to launch a Good Food logo, which is going to help a consumer. Uh, by looking at this logo, say that this actually is is ultimately good for me as opposed to another product which might not have the logo. But again, this is not a private sector approach. It's talking about a multi-sector uh, sector approach where you bring CSO, you bring uh, government, you bring donors, and you bring private sector to say what would work to make sure that um, you know people in the urban areas are educated on what their food choices are. 
Um, and again, on the approach of um, um, marketing, I think it also helps if you work together on consumer campaigns. We understand the correct messaging that we can use all of us uh, and, and make sure people are better educated. And lastly, uh, we have heard uh, previous speakers talk about technical support, about um, food safety and quality issues, which remains a very key issue for local uh, producers. And I think the biggest issue we have found with local producers is the lack of access to technical support or affordability issues to get uh, certified and harmonized with certain regulations. So I think a little um, a support around how we can ensure that urban um, producers and processors are able to access, understand um, the, the standards, understand what is expected of them to ensure that they're able to, to put um, food which is safe and of the right quality and also affordable for the consumer. Otherwise, I think it really great um, feedback uh, on the ASR uh, and we look forward to um, having our, our, our thoughts going forward. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Monica Mosonda. The very interesting points um, that highlighting the, the need for food safety, uh, our consumer, uh, consumer interests, and uh, uh, very, very useful perspective. Thank you. Okay, let us now move to the uh, executive director of the Trade Law Center. Uh, that would be Trudy Hartzenberg. Trudy, we'll look forward to hearing your comments. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for an extremely interesting um, experience this afternoon. I would like to focus on trade issues as they pertain to agricultural competitiveness, food security, and sustainable access to food, and focus in particular on some of the cross-border trade issues. Um, we've heard some salient reference to the African continental free trade area, this is, of course, this very ambitious initiative to integrate the continent. Um, this is, must not be underestimated, of course. Integrating 55 member states at various levels of development is very difficult. I'd like to focus my comments as they pertain to agricultural competitiveness and trade, specifically on two sets of issues. The first one is trade facilitation. Trade facilitation assists to get goods from their location of production to the final consumer. And in many cases, of course, these goods have to cross borders. And that, this means taking into account time on the road, but also time spent at border posts. And this is where very often we find not only tariff barriers, which for certain food products are particularly high still in Africa, but also the non-tariff barriers, the documentation required, whole range of issues which can slow down trade. And for food, of course, this is particularly important as food is time sensitive. And delays at the border post may not only mean loss of competitiveness, but actually loss of the actual consignment completely. So what can we do to assist to facilitate cross-border trade? And the discussion, particularly during this COVID experience currently, focuses on digital trade solutions. So this becomes important related to, for example, pre-shipment clearance, reduced documentation requirements, e-certificates and so on. That of course presupposes that we have energy security and connectivity security across the continent. So while digital trade solutions have an enormous amount to recommend themselves, there are certain prerequisites that we have to take into account. What we also need to do is to focus on some of the simplified trade regimes that some of our regional economic communities, for example, in Southern Africa have adopted. This will assist some of our small scale producers to get access to export market opportunities. But this also requires improvements in governance so that Customs officials, for example, are held accountable for the discretion that they may exercise at the border in terms of accepting a certificate or not accepting particular documentation. Second set of issues which have been mentioned by a number of our panelists already relate to health and food standards and safety. And these we find in the context of trade agreements and also of course in the African continental free trade area in the chapters and the provisions on sanitary and phytosanitary measures. 
These are absolutely critical. And they're important not only for trade, but also in a domestic context. And some very sad experience a couple of years in South Africa with a dreadful listeriosis outbreak indicated that loss of life from such a lack of standards adherence can cause significant loss of life. But food standards are important as far as trade agreements are concerned. But at the end of the day, the implementation takes place at national level. So this requires that we strengthen our national quality assurance infrastructure, the laboratories for testing, certification, and this entire value chain, which provides assurance to the producers, but also ultimately to the final consumers of food products. And I think this is an area that we need to take a look at. There are some very good examples where development partners together with government and the private sector have set up abattoirs that are accredited and which can provide assurance that those food and safety standards are going to be complied with. Monica's also mentioned other standards and many countries across the continent don't have organic standards yet. For example, my country, South Africa is one of those. So this means that if producers of agricultural and food products generally would want to be certified as organic producers, they will have to go through what are sometimes extremely costly international accreditation processes. This is again where cooperation across the African continent can assist to build the competitiveness of our producers and our food supply chains to assure food security and sustainable access to food. Thank you, Tom. Great, thank you very much, Trudy. Very interesting points. It's uh, really nice how this uh, panel is highlighting uh, such a wide range of, of issues that are all very important. And I think our next speaker will do the same. Uh, this is Professor Erastus Kiambi Kangete, uh, who is a food safety consultant, uh, and he has a very distinguished academic record in veterinary medicine and veterinary public health. Uh, Professor, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom, and thank everybody else for very good uh, contributions to this uh, discussion. Um, I would like to address the issues of food safety, and I would like to make maybe two or three comments. Uh, this is from what has been mentioned way from Steve, from uh, Rudy, and all the other as who have mentioned that food safety is key to this transformation, to this, to the feeding of our African cities. Uh, I want to start by saying that if you look at food safety in Africa, it's very down the lander of the policy environment and the governments. And um, it's not uh, very much uh, prioritized as a very important component in the, in the social development and even in the economic development. And I think unless African governments and the African uh, food systems start prioritizing food safety issues. It's not going to give us very, take us very far. We should be able to learn from what, are, what is happening. Uh, we have COVID-19, but this, as we know, came from foods and then later on became human to human transmission. Go back to 2003, we, uh, we, had, we had SARS, we had, we had MARS, and we had HIV, all these have had implications. Are there problems that are arising from food and later on ending up into humans? And we need to start thinking, how do we control this? Even as we think on how to feed African cities that are growing at a very fast rate, how do we provide that safe food to these many, many, many uh, people living in one, one place? So that is very important that we need to start thinking on how to prioritize food safety. If you look at the government's food safety is a very small department within maybe number of ministries who take care of food safety. It's, it's poorly resourced. And unless we can start making it appear important and look at it, then it's going to be very, uh, is one, sorry, is one of the major, one of the major disruptors that, bring social and economic is that 
policies that are going to help us to move food safety forward. And the major things we need include that we need to have policies that are going to look at food safety and try to remove a lot of redundancies that exist within our registrations and within our policy documents that will be able to help us move forward. One of these is a look at, um, we still have got urban agriculture not acceptable in some of our cities. Yet we are talking of food, we need to feed cities. The shorter the value chain, the safer the value chain. As long as we go out very far to get food to feed the cities, we should be prepared for problems that arise due to the longer the value chain. So how do we then, how do we then be able to feed the cities? We should be asking ourselves, as urban centers that are growing this far, going, are they able even to feed 50%? So we need to start looking at how do we invest governments to invest in food safety by making good policies. And when even you make the policies and make the, the regulations, can they be regulations that will allow the farmers, the smallholders, the large, the large farms be able to be compliant? I've, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing very good uh, what's coming from Musonda in, 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 in Zambia, that there is going to be a label for food for good food. Why wouldn't we be able to stagger our regulations and our, and, our, and our laws in a type of a staircase so that we can be able to bring food safety up in, so that we can be able to have people who are very poor at the moment in providing safe food move up the lander to go to, to be able to provide that food, safe food for our markets in the, in the, in the cities that are growing and growing. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, uh, Prof, uh, we're, we're running a bit uh, over now, so I wanted to, uh, those are excellent points. Maybe uh, you can um, uh, provide your final inputs uh, after, um, if we have uh, room um, after the, on the agenda. Let me move to the last panelist, then uh, we'll go to closing remarks uh, from the president of AGRA. But our last panelist is none other than Governor uh, James Nyoro, who is the beating heart of Kiambu, Kiambu County. Uh, so uh, James has a distinguished uh, career, both as an academic, he was the former director of the Tegameo Institute, uh, as well as uh, positions, high level positions at the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. So James, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, four minutes, please, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Tom. And let me take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, AGRF uh, for coming up with such a, uh, an important uh, theme at a time like now, having come out of or still within COVID and having known how markets are important uh, in terms of feeding the cities. But I think most of the things have been said and I want to thank uh, Steve and Rudy and all the, all the other people who have talked I'll just say just a few things. One, uh, from where I see it, having come from that side where we talk about what needs to be done, and then you get to this side where we start to see whether things are done or not. I think the most important thing for enhancing uh, feeding of urban cities is to make sure that we have wholesale markets, physical infrastructure for wholesale markets. I can tell you that uh, a lot of food is being produced but how it gets into the city really, really depends on whether you have uh, enough and sufficient high quality wholesale markets. Now, the question is, if you are a governor like I am in Kiambu with a population of uh, 2.4 million, just next to Nairobi, given all the uh, competing ads, at what point do I think that uh, uh, wholesale markets are important? And that is a dialogue that we need to have because all the issues you are talking about, uh, including food safety, including, I, I think there was uh, that, that picture that was shown in a market in Lusaka and so on, including now public health, which is a major contributor to issues such as COVID-19 is about uh, the wholesale markets and how they, ma they are managed and the hygiene in, in, in there. The other thing that we need to consider is that, uh, and it's, 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 it's good that we are doing this, but we forget what we had said before. Uh, I like the, the analysis that Steve went through to say that 
you are getting high value uh, products getting into the city. If you look at the periurban and look at areas like uh, Kiambu, which are surrounding Nairobi city, obviously you see those high value uh, vegetables, uh, eggs, uh, bacon, and so on and so forth. One of the reasons for that is that is where agricultural transformation has taken place. That's where they can be able to access technology because they are high value. Uh, they are no longer subsistence farmers. But the reason they are doing that is because the opportunity cost of their land is very high. So they cannot be able to put grains. They cannot put maize. Uh, they cannot survive with the profitability they are getting from maize. Then the question would be, how does that then uh, link to the further rural areas so that as you are getting this high value, you are still taking care of your basic grains. Remember, you know, an African in an African city will not say they have had food until they have uh, grains. So we have to balance the two. And coming on to uh, intensification and coming on to the high opportunity cost of land, you get to agricultural productivity. How do you enhance agricultural productivity even to the issues of competitiveness? Yeah, you are talking about appropriateness of technology. We have seen and practically done uh, with the help of uh, Agra and other uh, supporters, how if you appropriate the technology followed by the extension service, you can be able to double or triple productivity that reduces the price of food in the urban center. So these are things we talked about yesterday. We are now talking about feeding the cities. Let's remember the things that we talked about the previous day. And I, I don't want to exceed your time, Tom, because you know, having me become a politician, I can go on and on. But I also want to tell you one more thing. I don't know about other parts of Africa, but in Nairobi, the people who are consuming the food in the urban centers are actually peri-urban farmers. They are farmers even 40, 50, 60, 100 kilometers out of Nairobi. So what you are seeing is that people who are going out and producing and, and bringing that stuff either directly or indirectly into the urban centers. So you have a different lot of farmers, farmers who know how to check information on mobile phone, farmers who will be there over the weekend, but they have employed certain other people who are working on those farms. And finally, it's about food safety, which has been talked about. Uh, what, what you find is the irony. You talk about those ships that are coming to the Western coast to bring in raw quality chicken uh, from Brazil and wherever. And the reason why people are preferring them is because of price. So what do you then do in order to make the produce from the African uh, farms more competitive? How do you reduce sales? How do you reduce uh, all the cross-border uh, taxes? How do you ensure that there is free trade? So all these are issues that I think will become more important in this important topic you have brought up. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. It's, uh, even though I was about to do it, it's a very dangerous thing to interrupt the governor. You know, you don't do that. <laughs> I could end up in jail the next time I come to Kenya. But uh, it is a uh, wonderful and I think very appropriate to, to conclude now uh, with, uh, have, have the president of Agra uh, conclude this session. Uh, and, and I'm glad that uh, we have Dr. Agnes Kalibata, who's not only the president of Agra, but she's also the special envoy of the UN Secretary General for the 2021 Food Systems Summit. Dr. Agnes, please uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all that have participated in this conversation. Um, I apologize that my internet was not at the beginning, so I couldn't join at the beginning. So I, I really want to spend just a few minutes thanking you, thanking uh, Rudy for finding time and being part of us today. Rudy has been, uh, was one of the founding, the founding partners uh, in Agra, the very, very beginning, the, people, the few people that were there to advise uh, the late Kofi Annan as he was, uh, he was founding Agra. So it's really good to see you. And I love your belief in food systems from the very beginning. And uh, until now, when we actually are beginning to look at what you were telling us all along. Um, every year we put uh, together a team that looks at ASR. 
or the Africa Agricultural Status Report. Every year we think very hard about what the topic of the next ASR is going to be. And I couldn't be more proud. As I see these things come out every year, as, as I see your conversations come out, I really feel proud because, I mean, we, I think here we hit the nail on, on the head. We can actually use cities to, to, to really grow our rural populations. But we won't do that unless we address all the challenges that you all have talked about, whether it's what um, uh, Steve did a uh, very, very good justice to in his presentation, or what it's, uh, it's um, what Maximo highlight, highlighted. I had never linked land tariff barriers the way you did, uh, Maximo, and, and I really appreciated that you came together. All the idea of developing systems for Africa that uh, that Ismail brought out. You know, I, I, in the morning I, when I was talking to young people, I was telling them that the biggest opportunity we have in front of us that we have to rethink our food systems. So you talking about um, developing new food systems is really just that point. And then so many other things came out. Um, I don't think the idea that um, that Monica is the, the advocate for nutrition, that the voice that you bring again, could have come at a better time when we are seeing everyone in the three people that are dying, I, I mean that are obese as, as a result of poor nutrition. And Africa is busy being part of that, you know, and we need to rethink that trajectory. All um, the, the points that uh, Trudy brought out around loss of revenues, loss of competitiveness, as food safety, key challenge that we all think, we, we are all think, thinking about. You know, I could go on and on. And again, uh, I wanted to to bring out the cost of doing nothing that uh, that uh, Erastus talked about. Billion that out of not be food safety, or the points that uh, that the governor is making. I like the word irony, the irony of these things. When I talk about how Africa cares about calories, and a lot of people are talking about nutrition, people don't understand where I'm coming from. But you just made me understand that it's the irony of the environment you are living in, the irony of the work that we are doing. Yeah, it's a time when we should be caring about nutrition, but again, we care so much about calories, even though we know that that has a huge impact on, 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 on our, our health and our systems and everything. So I just have to, to end this session. I'm sorry because the, the other session has started and I know you all want to be part of the, the opening ceremony, I, but I really wanted to thank you all. I wanted to appreciate the, the team that put this, this report together. And I look forward to the rest of the AGRF, and I hope you look forward to the rest of the AGRF too. And we really uh, look forward to continue working with you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Tom, for moderating this session. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Agnes. Thank you very much for having us here. Okay, and for uh, for uh, you know, this is a wonderful annual uh, tradition now. I think this is maybe the seventh or eighth time, and uh, each each year seems to be getting. Uh, weightier and weightier. So congratulations to you for presiding for these very interesting. Thank, thank, you. Uh, thank you, and I have to leave thank now. <laughs> Good, okay, all right, thank you. So we have one more uh, uh, e event uh, um, uh, for th this session, and this is the official book launch. Uh, so for the official book launch, let's uh, uh, take it to Dr. Rabinge. Dr. Rabinge, uh, are you still there? Your your um, video is off. There you I'm go. still there, and uh, I put on the camera again. Yes. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. The floor is yours, please. Uh, I think it is an honor and a pleasure that uh, the the launch of this uh, uh, report takes place. It is the uh, we have discussed uh, in this panel all the distant issues uh, which were summarized very well by uh, Agnes Kalibata and uh, the, uh, the need to uh, emphasize uh, the food situation in the big cities, but not only as a challenge, but also as a very important chance that uh, for the improvement and for the stimulation of agriculture development in Africa. And so I think it's a great pleasure for me to um, uh, applaud AGRA and their many stakeholders and partners for addressing this challenge of uh, feeding Africa's cities and for fueling this challenge 
as an opportunity to refocus efforts on the urban food systems that increasingly drive populations and opportunities for African farmers. It can't be said more, and uh, the uh, and uh, Tom, you uh, uh, rightly indicated that it's very important to look very carefully. What is the role of the farmers? The farmers have to play an important role, and they have to strengthen their ties such that they can be effective on the markets. They can't be overruled by the retailers or the big commodity firms. If they strengthen each other's uh, position and collaborate, for example, in cooperatives, We've seen it in Europe at several places where they, when they are active, that will help considerably to strengthen their power on the market and to strengthen their competitive ability, which is vital for the further development of uh, agriculture and for food security, especially in Africa. Africa should feel, uh, feed itself within the next few decades and uh, even in a situation where the population is doubling. And I think there are ample opportunities to do it Agra has a major role to play there, and I think this report helps to fulfill the requirement for the big cities. So thank you all for being here, and thank you all for enabling the situation of having this book and this report, which I think is timely and is very necessary and will fulfill certain requirements. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rabingi. Very, very... Uh apropos uh, comments on the on the book. Now, uh, we've reached the close here, but before we sign off, um, I think that there is great interest in understanding how to access uh, the book. Uh, it's supposed to be online. Uh, I'm wondering if the organizer, uh, Aaron, if you can, as moderator, are you able to post the link? Um, and uh, so that all the people on the, uh, Zoom call here will have a Zoom link that they can go to. Andrew? <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, the, the link has been posted on the chat and the links page on the uh, Zoom uh, uh, page for this meeting. Great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Uh, so I think that then brings us to a close. Uh, although this is just the very beginning of the conference, so I hope all of you on the line uh, will be able to tune in to uh, some of the other virtual meetings for the next uh, four days. So with that, let me thank all of the uh, participants here, the uh, keynote speaker, the uh, Steve, uh, your, your, your uh, introduction to the book and to all the panelists. Uh, thanks very much for engaging in this uh, interesting session. It's been a pleasure.